Hi, this is going to be a long video, as you can tell by the time of the video, but yeah, I went to my favorite bookstore again today. I traded in 11 books. I tried to trade in 12, but they wouldn't take one because they already had some, but yeah, I traded in 11 books. Most of them were, about half of them were contemporary poetry I had to buy for a class that I didn't like. A couple of them were like books that were in bad condition that I will maybe end up buying a better edition of. And then uh, a couple of them were just uh, books that I ended up not liking, made a mistake. But uh, yeah, they gave me a decent amount of money for them, so I ended up buying seven books. And I only had to pay a small amount for them, so I'll show those today. And then I also ordered a, an anthology of uh, Russian poetry from the 20th century. It's, uh, it's around a thousand pages and it's selected by Yevgeny Yevtushenko. So uh, I've been reading that, at least the early 20th century poems, and they're all extremely good. So I'll read a couple poems from there. But uh, to start off with, I have uh, The Confessions of Edward Dahlberg. And these are pretty interesting. Uh, Edward Dahlberg was a author born in, uh, I think like 1901, something like that, really early in the 20th century. And he grew up very poor. His, uh, he had a single mom and she worked really hard to provide for him. And then he got into a decent college, ended up writing. First he wrote about uh, the life of poor people. And a lot of people gave him, I know, Gave him a hard time for that, but he said, uh, you know, basically, is is life clean, you know, uh, so to say that like his books had, you know, vulgar subjects in them, but that's that's life. Oh yeah, and sorry, if this is kind of an unusual position for making a video, but I didn't want to hold my phone, and behind me are my dad's bonsai trees. Yeah, but uh, I'll read a little bit of this book and show you what it's like. In the very beginning, he wrote in naturalist style, like, like a lot of authors did in the 1920s in America. But then this is when he was in his 60s and 70s, and he wrote in a neo-baroque style, which uh, I really enjoy. A lot of uh, Latin American or Spanish language authors did this too, where uh, they wrote in a neo-baroque style in the late 20th century. Not sure why it happened, but it's I, I really enjoy it. Because uh, I think it was Borges who said Baroque is basically the like the pinnacle of literature because it means something specific. But uh, yeah, anyway, here's this. He quotes Erasmus in the beginning. I owe nothing to my birth, for I don't know who my father was. Nothing to learning, for I have none. Nothing to youth, for I was old when I began. This is how it starts. At 19, I was a stranger to myself. At 40, I asked, who am I? At 50, I concluded I would never know. Know thyself is a wise Socratic exhortation, but how is it possible? Do I even understand a tithe of my nature? In truth, I know nothing about anybody, least of all about myself. No matter what I do, it is likely to be wrong. One bungles everything, for the brain is feeble, and an intuition is a saline and marshy guess. Whatever one has done, he will do. That is his character, and he can neither improve nor escape it. Who is wise except by accident? When I am intelligent, I am startled. Should I be as melancholy as Avernus, I am baffled. Making ready for an agreeable conversation with a friend, a seizure of unexpected spleen overtakes me. Then there are strokes of idiocy and unreasonable gales of mirth. So, yeah, that gives an idea of the style. I really like it. And then, uh, oh yeah, I got very lucky. For some reason, like every edition of uh, Boris Pasternak's poetry is expensive. Like the Penguin edition, it was like $100 on Amazon. I think it was a mistake. I think some algorithms made a mistake, but now it's still like 20, but it shouldn't be that high. Somebody should reprint it. But I found this really interesting book it was published in Moscow in uh, 
it must have been 1990 because it was the 100 year uh, anniversary of Pasternak's birth. But yeah, it was published in the USSR right before it disintegrated. So somehow it came from the USSR to America in 2017 and I bought it. It has bilingual stuff. I can't read the Cyrillic, but a lot of them were translated by, I don't know who it is, but her last name is Pasternak, so she must be related to him somehow. Maybe, maybe it's his granddaughter, great-granddaughter, not sure. But a lot of his poetry is also in this 20th century anthology that uh, I'm going to read a little bit from. But yeah, I just, uh, I think it's so amazing that this came from USSR in 1990. Someone must have brought it here. Someone must have liked it. And maybe they died or something. <laughs> and then uh, I got another book of poetry called Figures of Speech by Enrique Lin. He's a Chilean poet. And uh, I wanted to read one of his poems. I'll just read it in uh, English. It's titled Literature. When I find myself around other writers, we do little more than speak like good or bad functionaries of literature. One has been published by 21st century books, and another, like me, the chief editor, will never pay him for his copyright. When I run into literature, I don't doff my hat. I like my friends, but not one of us will go very far. Nearer the horizon, those who shine, where those who shine who an imbecile would label stars of the first order of magnitude. When I run across such stars of the first order and those peacocks shine with the necessary prudence, I'd like to invite them to puke, because writing as well as they is to perform the blandest task. When I come upon myself facing the empty page, I think of peacocks and try at least not to show off. But I write to the extent of my hatred for literature, and to young authors I would like to yell, cut it with the farce. You too will enter the business because literature is the softest of jobs, even for those who can't stand its work. Look how one star of the first magnitude is eclipsed, and don't turn around and stick your hands in the fire. Nobody has managed to do his duty, except for a couple of repugnant types. And he who shone stretched out and plucked while in spite of his shouts of protest, necessarily well articulated, and what? Perhaps the void was his audience. They returned to their pantries, converted to consumer goods, by those for whom his calls were meant, industrious people in their idleness and afflictions, and for that reason, the only lovers of beauty, the Olympian cat. The seven lives of the poet are enough, and more to turn a terrorist into a regular guy, but literature is all the same, the reverse of an actual scandal, at the most a good investment in history for those rare moments when barbarity doubles back and heroism in opposition stops being overly esteemed. Sensitive souls sprout like mushrooms, moved by the testimony of shadowy times. That gives a good idea of his poetry. He was praised by Nicanor Para. But, yep. I really like him. I first found his stuff in Austin because um, this was actually translated by a publisher in Austin, Texas. And then uh, this is a book I've been looking for for a while. And I knew it was at this bookstore, but I haven't been to this bookstore in over a month. So, yeah, I wasn't, uh, maybe not a month, but it's been a little while. And I only really looked into this book recently. It's uh, Studs Lonigan by James T. Farrell. And it's a book about a guy growing up in the early 20th century. I think it starts in the late teens, around the time of World War I. And it continues through the beginning of the Great Depression. And this guy is supposedly a naturalist, like stylist, where he tries to capture the, uh, basically how it was like to live back then. And uh, I, I, for a little while, I've been wanting to read something about Chicago because I used to live in a, sh a suburb of Chicago, and I have several 
books about New York where they capture it pretty precisely about the 1920s. And yeah, I've, I've been interested in Chicago for a little while. And uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to find this there. And then I got The Girls by Henri de Montalant. He's a French author from the 20th century, and this is a book he wrote. It takes place in the 1920s, and I read on the Wikipedia page, like, someone was really harsh on this book in the Wikipedia page, which is not reasonable for it being an encyclopedia. They, uh, you can tell whoever wrote the Wikipedia page was a feminist because they call this book anti-feminist and uh, I'm not even sure if feminism was really a thing. Wait, I don't know when this was written, but at least in the time period that it takes place, I'm not even sure if feminism was a widely known thing. Yeah, I guess 1954, so that's plenty of time for Simone de Beauvoir and whoever else, but yeah, it's just really bizarre how they talk about it on the Wikipedia page, but I've heard a lot of good things about him, this writer, and figured I'd give it a shot because I'd like to see what Paris was like, or France at least in the 1920s. And, uh, yeah. I don't really care about the politics of an author. Basically doesn't matter. And then uh, another book I got is a Glastonbury romance. You see that? It's by John Cowper Powis. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think that sounds right. I don't think I said that right, but... This is a book published in 1932, and it takes place... Glastonbury is where the... the uh, legend of King Arthur was supposed to have taken place, and... Uh, this book kind of focuses on that to an extent, but it's kind of an like uh, an epic tale. It's compared to War and Peace. But I just wanted to read the very first section here because I think it's pretty interesting. This is chapter one. At the striking of noon on a certain 5th of March, there occurred within a casual causal radius of Brandon Railway Station, and yet beyond the deepest pools of emptiness between the uttermost stellar systems, one of those infinitesimal ripples in the creative silence of the first cause, which always occur when an exceptional stir of heightened consciousness agitates any living organism in this astronomical universe. Something passed at that moment, a wave, a motion, a vibration, too tenuous to be called magnetic, too subliminal to be called spiritual, between the soul of a particular human being who is emerging from a third-class carriage of the 1219 train from London and the divine diabolic soul of the first cause of all life. So yeah, that kind of struck me as being interesting. And then the fact that it was written in 1932 and it's pretty highly regarded and uh, it's weird that not many people talk about it, too, despite it being very highly regarded. You know, a lot of people talk about the more uh, blatantly experimental writers. So, yeah, it'll be neat. It was very cheap, too, so can't beat it. Then the last book that I bought was um, Palinuro of Mexico by Fernando del Paso. And I've been looking at this book for a while. I actually had it in my Amazon cart like a week ago, and it was only $5, but uh, I bought it too late. Like, I wanted to buy it too late. I think someone must have ordered it for themselves for Christmas or maybe for a friend because it's not in there anymore for that price. But yeah, luckily I found it here, and uh, I've, been, I've, like, I've been aware of this book for a while, like probably over two years now. But... Uh, I'm really kind of flippant when I go into a bookstore and look for stuff I'm interested in. I, uh, you know, it's a situation of overabundance where there's so many good things that you can kind of like, you can 
miss good things because you know you can get back to them eventually. So I was kind of like that with this book because I would open it up randomly, read some random page in the middle, see something that was kind of like, like, yeah, that's kind of weird. And then I would just put it back. I swear I found this book in three different bookstores. And for one reason or another, I, I, I didn't pick it up. But uh, right after I uh, went into the bookstore, I, I read a little bit of the first page and I thought it was interesting. And then um, right after I left the bookstore, which I spent six hours at, I spent six hours at a bookstore. They open at nine, I got there at 10. And I only started realizing I had been there for a while, like around two o'clock. I had been there for almost four hours and I didn't even notice it. It's crazy, but yeah, so I started reading the first page and I really enjoyed it. And then after I left the bookstore to go eat, because I was very hungry, I read the first like five pages or so and I, I really enjoy it. But um, this is also pretty funny what he wrote here. In the beginning, you know how they say like, nobody in this book is a, is a real character so they can't get sued or whatever. This is what it says. This is a work of fiction. If certain characters resemble people in real life, it is because certain people in real life resemble characters from a novel. Nobody therefore is entitled to feel included in this book. Nobody by the same token to feel excluded. <laughs> yeah, I like, it's kind of funny like that because it just play with stuff. Like I remember when I was younger and I just started reading, I thought it was funny that in the back they would say, this book is available at, at any fine bookseller, you know, it's just kind of like playful with the idea of a book. Yeah, I hear good, I hear really good things about this author, Fernando Del Paso, so I'm sure I'll enjoy this. So that's all the books I got today at the bookstore. But uh, now I'm just gonna read a little bit. I'm gonna read two poems from this anthology. It's, uh, it looks like this. It has a really nice cover. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. 20th century Russian poetry, silver and steel. Selected with an introduction by Yevgeny Yevtushenko. And then some other people edited it. But the first one I'm going to read is by Alexander Bloch, and uh, he's pretty highly regarded. I think the top, like the four major 20th century Russian poets are uh, Alexander Bloch, Marina Tsvetaeva, Anna Akhmatova, and then Boris Pasternak. I think those are the four. And in this anthology, I haven't gotten to Tsvetaeva or Pasternak yet, but um, I really love Alexander Bloch. I haven't read his stuff before yet, like maybe one poem online or something like that, but his stuff doesn't seem to be widely available. Neither does uh, Marina Tsvetaeva and Pasternak, as a matter of fact, but there's a book that has the complete Anna Akhmatova, I think. Yeah, there is. But uh, unfortunately, she's the least interesting to me of the stuff that I've read. And, uh, an interesting thing about that is uh, at the bookstore near my apartment in Austin, there was um, a book opening by this translator who translated a bunch of Svetaeva's journals. It's, uh, it was just put out by the New York Review of Books Classics, I think just this month. Yeah, it must have been, because that's when the book opening was. And she read some of the passages and talked about how she translated it and also gave a little overview of Svetaeva because she's not really popular in uh, English-speaking countries, it seems. And the stuff that she read was very interesting. And I can imagine she's a very good author in Russian, but uh, the translator said that she doesn't really come across in English very well because her stuff is so heavily based on the language. And, uh, you know, they said something like, um, rather than putting, putting the world into language, she, she draws the world out of language. So then, you know, as far as a poet goes, those, are, those types of poets are extremely difficult to translate or even to uh, easily understand in the original language usually. But 
So this is Alexander Bloch. It's called By the North Sea. I'm not going to read. Uh, yeah, screw it. I'll read the whole thing. What were those strolling fops and dandies making of the seashore? They set up tables, smoke, chew, sip soft drinks, then wander about the beach, moodily laughing and infecting the salty air with their gossip. Then their drivers take them out in kibitkas, covered coquettishly by canvas into the shallows. There are the women changing their funny dresses and the men their uniforms for light bathing wear and exposing flabby muscles and chests. They tiptoe, squealing into the water. They probe the bottom with clumsy feet. They shout as if to prove they are enjoying themselves. But over there the sunset has created from the sky a deep and many-colored goblet. One glow stretches its arm out toward the other, and sisters of twin heavens, they spin a single mist, now pink, now mauve, and a cloud drowning in the sea, furiously, in its death throes, sends from its eyes fires, now scarlet, now blue. And on the long pier, reaching gray and rotting out into the sea, reading the graffiti, with you always, Kate and Kolya were here. Brother Didior and Novice Isidore were here. Wondrous are the works of God. Reading the graffiti, we go out to sea in a pot-bellied, farcical motorboat. Gasoline putt-putts and reeks. Two wings curve out into the water behind us. The swift wake curls and leaving far behind the idlers on the beach, the fishing boats, the narrow headland, the lighthouse. We run out with a many-colored wash into the wide, expansive, tender brine. On the horizon behind us, far away, a conflagration sends up a silent glow. The fishing island of Volney stretches in the water like a flat back of the sea creature. But ahead in the distance are boat lights and the wandering shaft of a customs vessel searchlight. And we go out into the pale blue haze. The buoys lean slantwise from the water like panicles marking the roads, and far away from buoy to buoy loom sails of fishing schooners. A calm holds the sea, under sail a lovely lady, an ocean-going yacht. On the slender mast hangs a small lantern which, like the precious coronet stone, burns in the dull brow of the sky. And on the bow, in complete silence, amid the fantastic clutter of tackle, there sit cross-armed people in bright Panama hats, pulled down over stern faces, and in their midst, by the mast itself unspeaking, a sailor stands, dark, and watches. We round the yacht decorously enough, and one of us courteously and softly says, Do you want a tow? And with impressive simplicity, a stern voice answers us, No thanks. And rounding them once again, we watch with souls devout and overflowing the silently receding silhouette of the lovely lady under sail, the coronet's precious stone burning upon the swarthy brow of the dusk. So that's Alexander Bloch. And then the other poet I'm going to read is, I've already read a little bit on here, but it's uh, Osip Mendelstam. And... Uh, He's, he's really interesting. I kind of read this as like proving me wrong, so to say. And uh, this one's called, I'm going to read two. I must read only children's books is the title. I must read only children's books, cherish only children's thoughts, scatter all big things far and wide, rise up from the deep-rooted sadness. I'm weary to death of life and accept nothing from it. But I love my unfortunate land because I've not seen any other. In a far-off garden I swung on a simple wooden swing, and the tall, somber fir trees I recall in misty delirium. And then uh, this poem on the same page, A Body Was Given to Me. A body was given to me, what to do with it, so unique and so much my own, for the quiet joy of breathing and living, who is it, tell me, that I must thank? I am the gardener, I am the flower as well. In the dungeon of the world, I am not alone. On the glass of eternity already has settled my breathing, my warmth. A pattern prints itself on it, unre unrecognizable of late. 
Let the lees of the moment trickle down. The lovely pattern must not be wiped away. So that's this anthology of Russian poetry that I really enjoyed. It has 253 poets and I think, yeah, 830 poems. So, well, I hope you've enjoyed this. I uh, got some good books recently. So, um, yeah, let me know if you are interested in any of these or if you know about them. If I should read them sooner than anything else. Uh, death is a gang boss.